by Arts Boston, Front Porch Arts Collective, and the Boston Center for the Arts. Thank you all so much for coming out to have some conversations about the industry today of criticism as well as art reporting and how the Boston art scene has been changing. Yes, uh, so welcome, first of all, thank you to our friends at the Boston Center for the Arts for this beautiful space. Um, thank you for the wine, thank you for all the good good times. Um, PCA has set this up a fantastic partner to us at Arts Boston. Um, thanks to those of us joining us remotely from the HowlRound live stream. Sorry, we're a little late. Um, uh, and that uh, video archival footage will be up a couple days after this event, so feel free to share with your colleagues. Let them know. Um, our sponsor would like to thank our sponsors, Mass Cultural Council and Bank of America, and specifically their support of the network. So the network parts and administrators of color was founded in 2016. Um, there are other, our program is also a sponsor on this event. Um, and it is open to arts administrators of color, um, self-identifying arts administrators of color, um, who work in or around Boston, either for an arts organization or on their own consulting freelancing. Um, this is another issue tonight. So if you are a person of color who works in the arts, Please feel free to come talk to me if you're interested. And if you're not a person of color um, and you work in an organization, feel free to talk to me about how uh, your POC coworkers and employees might benefit from the network. So, yeah. Anything else? What other things? Files have been passed out, so yes. hopefully you grab those on your way in so we can skip that whole part where we read all the amazing accolades of our panel panelists here behind us. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Pascal because she's actually moderating. I can't think of a better person to moderate this panel. She is. <laughs> work on this. Um, so yeah. Let's do it. Are we ready? Y'all ready? Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much to our panelists who were able to join us tonight. I'm going to give them all an opportunity to go down the line, say their names, tell us a little bit about themselves, and then i got plenty of questions for us to start with. Hi, I'm Maria Garcia. I'm the senior editor of The Artery. Uh, the Artery is WVU's arts and culture team, and it includes a uh, full-time arts and culture reporters, as well as a robust pool of contributors. Um, and we do both arts reporting, um, enterprise stories on the arts, as well as traditional um, about different art forms. And I'm Ed Siegel, the former artery editor. <laughs> <laughs> I retired uh, about a year and a half ago, and handed things over to Maria. And, uh, Still, she lets me write occasionally. And, uh, uh, before that, I was television and theater critic of the Boston Hi there. Uh, my name is Jameson Johnson. I'm the founder and editor in chief at Boston Art Review. Uh, we are currently Boston's only online and print publication committed to facilitating dialogue around contemporary visual art in Boston. We are a volunteer run team and community supported. Um, so find me afterwards if you have any questions about how to get involved. I'm Zoe Vidana. I write about music, mostly classical, for the Boston Globe. Hi, I'm Catherine Boland. I am a dance writer uh, for Dance and Formal currently, and I've written for various publications, including Dance Studio Life, a DIY dancer, and a lot of <laughs> Thank you all so much. So the way the panel is going to work tonight is I have about like uh, five, six questions to ask the panelists and we'll have a conversation and then we'll save the last like 15, 20 minutes to open up to the audience. So if you have any questions that you'd like or some conversation to start, we can go from there. Sound good? Awesome. All right, let's get started. So can you all tell us, and whoever wants to go can go, uh, what brought you to writing a criticism? What was your first introduction to? Well, I was, uh, when I was at Boston University, I was the editor of the VU News, which was a radical uh, weekly newspaper. And I thought that when I graduated, that people would just be knocking on my door. To, uh, <laughs> to Come right for us, Ed. And, uh, <laughs> and it was a long wait. And you know, while I was waiting, I started watching a lot of television. <laughs> and it went into my slapper phase. And, um, and one of my housemates said to me, you watch so much TV, why don't you write about it? So I called up the editor of the Phoenix, which was the alternative, main alternative weekly at the time, and I said, you don't have anybody writing about TV. He said, you want to do it? Yeah. <laughs> That's my origin story. <laughs> Graduated from George Washington University, 
right around the financial crash. So okay. I was like, I don't think even a traditional path is going to be all that safe for me. I might as well do what I want in life. I was a dance major, um, and I wanted to teach yoga. <laughs> so I was a yoga instructor. And then I thought, mm, the ma master's degree would be good. You know, something a little more stable. So I ended up in Boston because I got my degree in dance and therapy from this university. Mm -hmm. And then, mostly graduated with that, it really hit me. I don't think I'm interested in the clinical mental health for it. It's not where my interest lies. Um, and so I transferred things more to yoga again, and then found that didn't really pay the bills fully. Talk to a yoga instructor if you have questions about that. Um, and I just remembered I loved writing about dance as a as an undergraduate at Washington University. You know, I always loved to, to write. And I got a little away from the journalism end of things, but I loved, I knew I loved contemporary issues and historical context, and I got a journalism award way back when I was much younger. Um, put something together, found some old reviews I'd written in college, sent it to an editor at Dance and Forma, and she said, sure, join our team. And it kind of took off from there. I reviewed a few shows, and I really like this. I really, really like this. And I've been doing it about four years now since then. Wow. So I guess my path also started as an undergrad. I, was, I went to Oberlin College, and there are too many concerts for anybody to ever go to on that campus because the college and the conservatory share the campus. So there's student ensembles, there's visiting guest artists, or there were at the time, it's going through a few changes that I haven't really kept up with. So don't quote me on that for if you know anybody who's interested in Oberlin about those guest artists. <laughs> but in any case, um, I had gotten, I started getting into classical music shortly after I stopped playing it because I was trained as a pianist and then I kind of lapsed. Um, as soon as I didn't have to play it, I started liking listening to it a lot more. And it was my good fortune that when, uh, in my freshman year, in the month of January, now picture January in Ohio. It is cold, it is bleak, it is, there are not formal classes on Oakland's campus at that time. Usually it's, people do um, intensive courses or they do their own projects and my, and the course that I was taking, actually, it wasn't really holding my interest for whatever reason. But there was going to be a bunch of free concerts on campus. All I knew was that there was Cleveland Orchestra was going to be playing basically in my backyard. And Alex Ross, whose, whose book, The Rest of Noise, I had just read, was going to be giving a lecture before that. So I'm like, of course I'm going to that. So I go, and after that, David Stoll, who's the Dean of the Conservatory at the time, gets up on stage and says that, all those, those 13 students up there, there in the balcony, they were all lofty upperclassmen, none of whom I knew, um, were all competing in this inaugural Institute for Classical Music Criticism for a $10,000 prize, but all you audience members, which included me, can also compete for $1,000 if you write a review and submit it by 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> and I had nothing else to do, so I did those sort of after three nights that I was that I was that were eligible. I did not win that prize, but I knew that I was I knew that I was interested in writing criticism from then forward. And I did not seriously pursue it at that point, but it was something that I knew that I liked. So when they offered that class again, my senior year, that class on music criticism, I decided to take it. And that's what kind of kicked it off. Right. <laughs> um, so I took kind of an unconventional route to arts criticism and writing. Um, while I was living in New York very temporarily, where working what I, I called my, my corporate era for six months, um, I was <laughs> super bored at my job, and so I would spend my lunch breaks into my afternoons writing newsletters to my friends. And the newsletter, <laughs> they didn't ask for it, I was just like, you're on my email list now. Um, and this newsletter, in a matter of like four months, evolved into having 600 people on the list that like I didn't know, and it was this very fun place where I was just writing about like things that were happening in my day-to-day, -day, art I was seeing, events I was going to, and when I got back to Boston, um, I wanted to keep doing that, but for art in Boston. Um, I couldn't find a platform that 
wanted me to do that for them, so I make my own. And now, fortunately, I don't have to do most of that writing, and we have fantastic writers that submit to us, and we publish in print twice per year and online throughout the year. Um, sometimes I'll still take my newsletter approach and wax poetic on like what I had for breakfast before the gallery tour, but <laughs> most of the time, um, I'm, I'm happy to kind of share that platform now with our community. Um, so my background is uh, more rooted in traditional journalism. Um, I come from a commercial media background. Um, I was in commercial television for um, about 12 years, and I um, covered policy and politics along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, it was incredibly rewarding work. work. Um, I traveled along um, all of the southwestern states, um, and sometimes into Latin America. Um, and I did it for different television stations um, across the country, and also um, for the network occasionally. Um, and, and then I kind of grew out of it. Um, I don't think you're the same person you are when you go into your career than you are mid-career. Um, and suddenly I woke up and I said, you know, I don't want to be a political reporter anymore. Um, I, um, I think I, I think this has ran its course. Um, and so um, I sort of inverted my life and I went back to grad school and I went to Columbia Journalism <coughs> School for Arts and Culture Journalism. So while I was a, uh, an investigative and a political reporter, it was so funny because I was like doing this hard reporting, but like all of the journalism that I found myself consuming was arts journalism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just decided that, I, that it was time for me to like act upon my passion. Um, so I sort of pivoted in journalism, I went into arts journalism, and then I heard about this reporting job at WBUR. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, I came in as a reporter um, as um, last year of working at um, WBUR. And, you know, when I walked into um, then WBUR general manager Charlie Kravitz's office, um, and I accepted the job, um, it was really because I knew the kind of arts journalism I wanted to do, and it was one that traded faux objectivity for radical transparency, um, and it was one that allowed, I wanted a kind of arts journalism that allowed me, and people like me, and people unlike me, to bring their full self. Um, and that doesn't mean you opine on every story, but that means you're incredibly aware of the place in the world that you occupy and the lens from which you look at the world and from which you look at the art. And it allows you, I think, when you bring your whole self to like be really cognizant of your blind spots and your biases um, and your privilege and your marginality um, all at the same time. And so I came um, to Boston and I met with Charlie and Ed at the time and I said, this is the kind of arts journalism I want to do. And they were like, great. What do you need to do it? <laughs> we'll, we'll give you the tools. Um, and it's been wonderful ever since. Um, I mean, it's, I can honestly say that, um, you know, I work with really, really committed people. I have a great team um, of both uh, full-time staff and, and uh, contributors. And so that's my arts journalism story. Thank you all so much. Yes, let's wrap them. Uh, why I wanted to ask you all that was just to really see the different pathways it takes to get to this um, field. I think there really isn't a uh, clear, like, this is how you become a critic, or this is how you write about art. And I've always been interested to understand, like, how we come to those places. So thank you all so much for letting us know how you came to that place. So how has writing and covering the arts and arts criticism changed since you all began? I know we're in a time now where Boston is really changing as an art scene, and so is the rest of America. But how have you seen the arts arts change as well as the way we talk in this game? Well, I think the way that I that I've changed um, yeah. is that um, when I was doing the TV criticism halftime, and I had started working at the Globe as an editor halftime. And the Globe job turned into a full-time 
job. Ultimately, I was uh, <coughs> excuse me, assistant living arts editor, uh, and I spent a lot of time thinking about criticism while I was watching uh, people at the Globe and elsewhere. And uh, one thing that struck me was that they were not. There were a lot of critics who weren't being really honest, um, but they were reviewing things based on what they thought they should like, like uh, uh, foreign movies, for example. Um, and, um, and I think that I had been a little guilty of that myself when I was writing about television. And um, at the same time, I've, I've read this one piece that really changed my focus on criticism, which was a piece by Andrew Saris, the movie critic in the, <clears throat> in the Village Voice, who, was, who wrote about the return of the Pink Panther, a movie that I had no desire to see. And he talked about it in terms of uh, Peter Sellers' genius, that Peter Sellers was the modern equivalent of Charlie Chaplin, and that this movie was a perfect example of that. I called my sister and said, well, this is the return of the Pink Panther. <laughs> and the two of us went, and we just laughed ourselves sick uh, throughout it. And it made me think that Saris, who had written another, uh, who had written a lot of, uh, about, uh, a lot of criticism himself that I that deeply admired, that he became kind of my role model for, you know, just, just focusing on on the art and, um, and not worrying about whether you're making a fool of yourself or uh, just being totally honest with how you approached the work of art and what it meant to you. And uh, uh, so uh, I think that when I went back to writing TV criticism for The Globe, I was really quite different and I uh, really saw uh, like politics, for example, that um, that a something like the Neo Era News Hour, which is now the PBS News Hour, <coughs> had no interest to me whatsoever because it was just talking heads, basically. Whereas something like the CBS Morning News brought the full extent of television artistry to the stories that it was covering, and um, and so I think that I switched from a content-only critic to someone who really kind of took a look at the form itself and, uh, and tried to marry the form. Um, I think I think there's I think there's two big shifts that I see, and and I think one shift is um, in the art itself, which is reflecting the world, and our world has changed and is changing, I think, at our culture is shifting at like a, a rapid pace, um, obviously due to our interconnectedness and the way we consume culture now, right? So I think like, one, like the art that we review has changed and thus I think the way like that, I think that criticism sounds um, is, is a bit different. Um, and that's simply because both, I think, cultural institutions and art makers and journalism, I think they're both having a reckoning. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're both having a reckoning with their legacy, with their history, with the people they have excluded, with the voices they have elevated at the expense of others. Um, I think both, we're seeing that both in culture and the producers of culture and, and the critics who are reflecting it. Um, and so there's this reckoning, right, both within journalism and within the actual art. So I think that's happening. But also, like, adjacent to that is, um, I mean, just like the industry of journalism is just like an ever-changing, competitive landscape. And so, um, Simply like the landscape of art criticism jumps is an ever shrinking, like complex ecosystem, right? And so, um, you know, I think in Ed's time, we we saw like that there were a number of critics positions. We simply the model of, of modern day journalism 
um, with the exception of some legacy newspapers, um, just does not really allow for full-time, for many full-time critics, especially for specific genres. Um, so, you know, you, you'll have like a cultural critic or an, or an opinion writer, um, but it's very, very hard to find like a traditional journalism institution that has a full-time dance critic, that has a full-time theater critic, um, that it's, it's, just, it's just hard to find. Um, the, I'm not saying that those positions exist, but I'm saying they're much more scarce um, because of the journalism model. And so the question is, how do you address these two changes, right? How do you reckon with yourself as a journalism institution and face as a journalism institution what voices you have left out? From what points of view have you um, practiced criticism? From what points of view have you reviewed art? Um, and is it time to change that? Right? And is it time to be intentional about changing that and, and prioritizing that in your editorial mission? Right? Um, at, while at the same time, like working within this very complicated, competitive media landscape, right? Um, and so uh, I, 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 think, I think organizations are grappling with that. I think, I think um, every journalism institution that provides um, criticism is grappling with, with how to deal with both of those changes, and I think there are different models. If I could tag on to that. Um, it's interesting. I, to tag off that second thing you were talking about, about moving to this new journalism model, this is like the phrase nowadays, right? Um, and how do we make journalism work in this online world where, frankly, there are fewer people by print newspapers. Now the whole 45th president era has changed that a bit, but essentially, <laughs> news is moving to online. So that's our world, and if artist criticism does move with that, it's not going to be great right? for arts criticism itself what it does. Um, and I wrote my senior thesis, I remember this was, again, financial crash, 2007, 2008, um, on this topic about where dance criticism was moving, where it needed to move. Um, and a few years before that, I think it's a key example also of what you're speaking about, about identities of critics and, and who they're lifting off and who they're not lifting off. Uh, the whole, it's quite, the dance world is called Plum Gate, where um, Alison McCauley at the New York Times said a sort of un very unnecessary and misogynistic comment about Jennifer Ringer, who, about her weight, and she had had a dance <coughs> eating disorder. She'd been very public about it. Um, and, and I think she, she stood up, and there were people who supported her. And that was, I think, that, that you could see that shift of she felt like she could speak up against this critic who basically in free reign, I don't know if he's since retired, but basically could say whatever he wanted. <laughs> um, and, and she went on all these morning shows and basically said, this has been my history and it's cool to talk about my weight in a review and it's also unnecessary. <laughs> so I, I think that's an example of, of where dance criticism is that I'm investing to. Um, we see that. Um, focusing on different identities and how they can speak about trauma and just the way we have a, a sort of evolving conception of trauma in, in this world, unnecessarily, I think. Um, and then oh, another thing I was thinking about, uh, in that shift to the online world, I know in uh, DIY Dancer is one um, publication in which I write that I really think they're kind of on the forefront of this, of like, what can criticism look like? And can we be open to different things that it might look like? And it also relates to not having full-time critics and do they get paid or is tickets their payment and how much time do they then devote. They've actually moved to putting shorter reviews on Instagram. Interesting. Oh, that's so, so there's interesting. a you know a few nice photos you can swipe mm. and then there's the review. And also sometimes they go in stories, Instagram stories. So there really are these ways that you can think creatively you could debate is that good for the field, is it not, or is the effect of that, but these things are possible. I think it's just interesting to, to know. If I can jump on that, um, the same thing with um, critics, well, older white male critics, let's be real, commenting on the appearance of people who are not older white and male is also something that's been very much been a part of classical music criticism for 
as long as past image of criticism has existed, basically, and only now we're starting to see a shift. Um, if any of you know of the of pianist Yu Wang, who is performing at Symphony Hall with the LA Film on Saturday, um, a few critics, she, so um, flamboyant costumes that are often very short and sequined or very long, flowy bandage dresses have, are an essential part of her onstage presence, and a bunch of people have felt entitled to comment on that. And only now, only now in the past few years, I think, since around the time that I started writing, people actually started pushing back. And I think that the role of that social media plays and is growing to play um, has been an integral part of that, especially Twitter. There is a large contingent of younger, very vocal classical music fans or hit classical music listeners and composers and musicians on Twitter. And also these musicians can so easily also, it's, it's a double-edged sword sometimes, because if you say something that a musician does not like or that an artist doesn't like, they can mobilize their fans wow. against the writer. That also ha that happened also, I think, with, I don't remember if it was a review of Lizzo's album. Yeah, or with, Yeah, for Ray Vermeer's album. So, and it, it, puts, it puts critics in a bit of a tenuous place sometimes. Like, on one hand, these social issues are, t are being talked about, but on the other hand, if an, ar if an artist has a large base of very devoted fans and that artist calls for them to attack the journalists that dared say something that wasn't 100% laudatory about them, it can have a chilling effect, or it might have a chilling effect, and I don't know where it's going to go, but it's, it's a complex new development for arts criticism. I also wanted to move back on the, some more of the online shift. Um, you know, I think that shift has largely happened and actually does coincide with the economic recession. Um, uh, there, I mean, there's a lot of independent publishers, especially in visual arts writing, that that was their kind of shutdown time and it became unsustainable to continue producing something in print. Um, I think now we're, we're 10 years beyond that and print objects have become something of like a special object. Um, I know many of us were here just last week for the Boston Art Book Fair, which was you know, a humongous room, the cyclorama filled with print and physical objects of art and arts writing um, and art books. And so with Boston Art Review, we have also wanted to kind of um, create something that can exist in a physical format because physical text has such a different life cycle than something online. I mean, I've seen this too, st Instagram stories that disappear in 24 hours, if not less. Um, having a review put on a platform like that it might be helpful for the hours that it's getting used, but it's not ultimately helpful to the artist or the institution or the gallery or the writer that has contributed to that work than being online. Um, so we have tried to, to kind of combat that in creating a print object. It's it's so expensive. Um, it's totally daunting, and any fundraising that we are able to do goes directly to printing this publication twice per year. And a lot of people like look me straight in the eye and go, "Why are you, why are you doing this? Why are, like just publish online?" Um, and then on the flip side of that, you know, I've had artists who have come up to me after the magazine comes out, like crying because they've never had to print their work in print before. Um, and that to me is like those are those moments that are so important and make that work um, worthwhile. So I think there's like this pendulum that swings, and we're kind of in the middle of it right now. Um, where print is being treated like a precious object, yet to kind of feed that cycle, we are forced to do things online and on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so it's kind of like these two competing things happening in the same world. It's confusing. I can also jump on the end of that for something I completely forgot to say first time around. Um, I was just in a meeting today with my editor and Jeremy Eichler, who is the other classical staff writer at The Globe, and we were talking about headlines and the difference between print and web headlines. So writing headlines, aside from transcription, is probably my least favorite part of the job, especially writing headlines for web. Because for web, because when you're reading the newspaper, you're opening it, you're paging through it, if something catches your eye, like there's many things that can catch your eye. Maybe it's the headline, maybe it's the photo, maybe it's just a straight word somewhere. There's more room for like, spontaneous discovery of something that's in print. But online, you're competing for clicks, and you're competing with every single other tab whoever in, has opened in their browser. So it's more inclined towards a strong emotional language that maybe you don't even really need. 
in your headline, just so people, just so you get those vital clicks, and you save the more like poetic and maybe not even poetic, but more descriptive, more accurate to what your true intention as a writer is for print. It doesn't cheapening feels like too strong of a word, but it definitely feels different. It definitely feels like it's it has an impact on the way I think about writing. It has a, it's starting to have an impact on the way that I write, knowing that I'm writing for somebody whose attention I have to like, beg for. Thank you all so much. And you know, one of the, one of the things that I've been really interested to talk about and understand more about um, the criticism world is how it has evolved and how it's changed. And what are the things that we in this industry are hopeful for that change? Like, what are we interested in seeing? And one of the reasons why I have this panel was I started a program last year called the Young Critics Program uh, with the Front Porch Arts Collective to incubate and foster the next generation of critics because most critics are of a certain age and are normally white and male and I really wanted to give us an opportunity to train young people so they have an, an opportunity to see what this career could be like. And that's the change that I'm hopeful for in this, you know, in this iteration of, of the criticism world and the arts, and I'm, and I'm wondering what what is the change you all would like to see within this industry, and especially for the specific different kinds of art that you all are talking or reporting about. Well, more money. <laughs> yes, <laughs> amen to that. I'll take that. Yes. Yeah. You know, when we talk about criticism moving online, um, we still want to have some kind of system in which people are uh, paid for their work, and I, I think that with everybody being a critic online, it's, there's a certain amount of depth of expertise. Uh, I mean, for all that you might want to say um, about legacy critics, and there is a trust that I have when I read a review by somebody who um, you know, has been given a certain imprimatur from uh, the New York Times or uh, WBUR or whatever that I I know that they are getting paid a fair amount of money for their work and that the people who uh, have hired them have done have done a certain amount of vetting and. Um, uh, have signed on to that person as a as a critic. Uh, when I just read Facebook posts, I you know I I, um, I don't have that kind of confidence. Um, so I think that there is a, that you that in criticism, as with everything else in life, you get what you pay for. And uh, so I would like to see a system created. And people in which there is funding for to pay people to become professional critics and I think that you're on the, that you're on the right track and that Maria is on the right track of the artery and that uh, there is uh, uh, I mean Zoe was hired through a certain uh, process uh, and so I would like to see that become a new I'd like to see us develop new funding models for developing groups. I would really love to see more support like mentorship programs for developing critics, because like no critic no critic of any genre in, appears like Athena rising out of Zeus's head, already grown <laughs> up, already knowing everything about their their area that they're covering. There's always going to be something that they're gonna, that they're going to learn. They already know some things, but there's there's some things that they're going to end up learning on the job. Whether that's the ins and outs of journalism, whether that's like things about whatever artist or art form or movement that they had never heard of before, and they're always going they're always going to be learning, and they are going to mess up. Like I'm going to mess up. Everybody here is going to mess up at some point. But I think that for younger critics, it's harder to take sometimes. It's hard to take what you know you messed up. And um, it's, it's harder to take when you know you messed up, and you need that kind of guidance and that kind of encouragement that, like, hey, it's okay, you're human. You're not supposed to be this all-powerful voice coming out of a high tower, even though that's, and I think that that's kind of what 
that the popular portrayal of critics sometimes is. So just like knowing that knowing that someone's got your back when you're new. Like I would definitely I may have not continued as a writer if I hadn't had the support of Steve Smith, who was the assistant arts editor of Boston Globe at the time I was a freelancer. Because I made a bunch of I made a bunch of screw ups and he always he, he was always there to like clean up the mess that non-house trained critic left. <laughs> I was just a baby. And also just like also just like look me in the eye and say that this did not mean that every, that it was all over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Picking up on that, but just the three of us have been talking about mentorship programs. Mm -hmm. It's premature to say what that might turn into, but it is something that's very actively on our minds. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think what I'm always asking myself is um, to what end, right? Like, of course, I'm always thinking about the pipeline. I'm always thinking about how to get these how to get new voices and how to get like a, 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 a robust sort of reflection of like what Boston looks like on 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 the artery, right? Um, but but then I think like okay, I have to remind myself like to what end? What what is it that I ultimately want this work to do? Um, and ultimately, like what I care about is disruption. I mean, what I care about is. Um, to provoke conversation, to engage collective civic dialogue that can, along with a confluence of other forces, catapult social transformation. I mean, that's ultimately what I care about. And like, that is, that is where my heart is. Like, that is, um, that's my priority. Um, is to expand the range of voices that we listen to and we read so that they more accurately reflect um, uh, the population in Boston and so that they lead to uncomfortable conversations um, that can disrupt inequity and that can create and catapult change. Of that um, completely. Uh, also, that a conversation about really the purposes, and I think it's plural, purposes of arts criticism to, to educate, to inform. Um, sometimes I, I read pieces in the New York Times or the Washington Post, and I come away thinking, I know what your experience of the work was, but I can't really see the work, I can't really feel the work. And I, I come to this with humility. I'm like, young writer, <laughs> and I've been doing this for four years. Uh, but when, when I write, and, and I've been told I accomplish this to at least some degree, uh, giving the reader a sense of what yeah. happened. Okay. If there's historical context, like this happened in the dance world, and then we can see that reflected in this work, those shifts over time, the historical context. Um, but at the same time, when my experience as a viewer is meaningful to what this work is, uh, and keeping in mind who I am as a writer. I was just thinking before when you were speaking about different identities of writers. Um, I recently reviewed a work in New York City um, of this LGBTQ, this, this uh, gay woman, but, um, lesbian. And it was all about her experience of being a lesbian in, the, in this world. And, and it, it was hard, it was dark. Um, and, and I. I said I wondered if a, some sort of trigger warning would be apt that we have to follow. But I said I come to that with humility, with my heteronormative, heteronormative privilege, right? I'm not going to tell a queer woman that she should have <laughs> a, um, a trigger warning. I just sort of presented the question, and then here's who I am coming to this question with humility. Um, so the, what are the purposes, and then we are coming to, what our experience is, is contextualizing who we are, whose work we're seeing, I think are important things to discuss. I think there also can't be criticism without readers and an audience. Um, sometimes it feels like I'm writing into the void and other times it doesn't. Um, so I think in terms of, you know, the, the original question was about like where do we see arts 
criticism going, right? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think dialogue with readers is so important. Um, I run a platform that unfortunately does not have the capability for comments or things like that, but when I get a note in my inbox, that's like the best thing ever. Um, so audience, who's here, like you obviously care about arts criticism and writing, engage with the writers that you read, let them know what you think. Um, I mean, maybe I shouldn't speak for everyone, but I, I love when, um, when we get feedback in our inbox or thoughts or, hey, did you consider this or check this out? Um, it's helpful and it makes it feel like you know, we're, we're writing for a community and not just for a, a link page. Can I ask, can I tag you? Yes, please. more people doing this work. <laughs> because I, I have a lot of dance artists asking me if I can come and do their shows and I'm one person. <laughs> Uh, and I feel badly every time I have to say no because I know it matters for when they're applying for grants, for their otherwise visibility out there. Um, and I've also had a friend say, well, if everyone was doing this, how much of it would be read? Um, but <laughs> at least if more people doing this work, I think, would mean a lot for all these different art forms. Yeah, I hear that all the time, you know, from different critics. You know, there's not enough of us, there's so much happening now these days, it's hard for us to split our time. And, you know, that's something I wonder about, too, like how can we make this kind of work accessible so that people can see as, a, as an avenue for them, so it's not the same three or five people going to see, yes, it's the money, right? It's the money, so can we get the money, please? Um, but, you know, I, I totally agree with you, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why I started this program, to give that kind, to give that pipeline or that opportunity for other people to see this as a possibility, and so it's not just on the two or three people who are so seasoned and have been doing it for years, so that it is a, it's a more of a pool that we can really diverse the different kinds of perspectives and those things that they can bring to the table that maybe those people who have been doing it for so long may not be able to. Uh, so one more question until we open up to the audience. How do you think arts criticism in Boston slash New England differs from other cities? You know, I, I'm, I'm not from Boston, from Miami, so for me, moving here and uh, creating a life here has been so has been so different than what I expected, and I've been wondering how that is changing from you know Boston to all the other places in New England and to other big metropolitan cities that have a robust art scene. And I wonder what you all think about that. Well, I do think that Boston is a robust city, but it's not an overwhelming mm -hmm. city. So that, um, so that one, when Laurie Anderson was talking about how in New York you have to, you almost have to specialize in one thing because there's just so much of that thing that you're interested in that you can't do anything else. And in Boston, I think that <coughs> even though there's a, a, a good theater scene there, it isn't so overwhelming that you can't do it. I did recently go to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, did you uh, read that piece today? You know, I mean, there, there's um, there's a robust music scene and the same thing. That, you know, you don't have to uh, you don't have to just specialize in classical music. Here. Whereas, if you're a New York, particularly if you're a critic in New York, you um, almost can't do anything else except the one thing. That Specializing, so I think that Boston is a really nice mix of um, of a city like New York on the one hand, and uh, and a city like uh, you know, I've often liked the fact that if you're in the Berkshires, that uh, that you go to everything at Mass Mocha, particularly in the off season, because there's nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> and but I mean that also exposes you to things that you wouldn't see otherwise. And I think that you have a breadth in a small town, and you have a depth in a place like New York, and Boston is a very nice mixture of the two. Did you all, um, did you read out Murray White's article in the Boston Globe about uh, Frank Stella in Boston? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, um, yes. <laughs> so, so I mean, so it was. I thought it was a really great article. Um, 
that I wish had been on our site, but um, <laughs> but it was a great article, and I'll give credit where credit is due about like how Boston reacted to um, uh, to abstraction in the '60s and '70s and even the '80s, um, and um, how it's like the, the particularly with visual arts the curatorial decisions that Boston made at the time um, were very tradition bound. And so there was sort of like this um, this prevailing attitude that like, oh, abstraction is a fad, it'll go away, we don't gotta collect that. You know what I mean? Um, um, and, um, you know, I, I do think that it, it was sort of one slice of Boston art life that Murray was able to unpack and say like, okay, people talk about Boston being so tradition bound, um, and here's like an example of how that happened over the decades, and like the decisions that were made both in like institution levels, but also just like that shaped the culture here, that shaped like the art culture here, and like, um, I just thought that was interesting. And like I think it's an example of sort of the, tra the, the tradition bound that you, that you hear about Boston, but also like I, you know I read like Ed stuff from back in the day and like Carolyn Clay stuff um, from back in the day, and I'm like moved by the rigor of their work and um, by like the the lineage that I feel like they have left to like other younger critics, you know, and like the richness that is there, like the expertise, the institutional knowledge, like you know, I still call and I like, still get emails from them like, and I need your counsel. <laughs> what do I do about this play? You know, um, and so so I, I see I see both sides. Like I I see that. Yes, I think Boston has had a reputation of being like incredibly conservative in some in some artistic genres, and I see why that's the case. But I've also I also see a lot of like rigor and a lot of like other sort of big cultural lineages in different disciplines here. Um, and and I yeah I just um, I'm excited to see like where they go in the future. And can I just amend one thing that I said? When, when I said the three of us were talking, my role is as a member of the Elliott Norton Awards Committee. So it's not just the three of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, so to talk about that, uh, an editor that put it pretty well that Boston, I, well, Boston is a very provincial city, yet at the same time, there's a spirit of innovation. And I think that the journalism here does reflect that in this environment we're in. Um, and there's this tension there, I think, um, being, you know, darkly progressive, you have a lot of progressive ideas, um, but there is that provincial influence. Um, and sort of what do we do with that? How do we capitalize on that? And having a strong tradition and a traditional base, but moving forward, um, I think is a, a useful frame to think about how we move forward. For a long time, and, and I can see it a lot still, um, people kind of talk about Boston's arts and culture scene with like an asterisk, like, well, it's, you know, it's not New York, or it's not LA. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're right, it's not. Um, this is Boston. There's actually, there's a great punk album called This Is Boston. <laughs> <laughs> like, deserves a reference. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I think in terms of our, our writers and our community here, there is starting, I'm starting to see more of a shift. I feel like that asterisk is getting dropped um, a lot more often, and that's great. Um, and I think it's up to, to all of us and to all of our peers and colleagues who write as well to ensure that the way that we're speaking about Boston is honest and without this kind of contextualizing of like, oh, we are this smaller city or this shadow city. Um, it, it, does like, oh, the only thing that does is help like that speaking about Boston with pride for our community and the art and the things that are happening here helps all of us but more specifically it helps the writers who are and the artists who are being spoken about um, and that's you know something with Boston Art Review we've been really committed to whenever we put something in print 
we work really closely with the artists and um, I know that's unconventional for a critical journal or publication, um, but if we're going to be putting something in print and that might be the only print object that they're going to have for that whole year, we want to make sure that it's going to like do the best job for them. And you mentioned earlier, like, there's not enough writers to to cover things. Um, you know, that writing might be helpful for an artist who's applying for a grant or a residency. Um, just actually earlier this week, someone from the BCA said, can you send us that article that you guys wrote on shock and ending? Because we need it to ask for, I, for, I don't know exactly what it was for, but they were like, we need it to ask for something. I'm like, yes, awesome, that's what we're here for. Um, so anyways, long grant, drop the asterisks. This is Boston, not anywhere else. <laughs> that's a great way to segue to audience questions. Great, yes, I'm gonna ask, unfortunately, I'm gonna have Audrey and Seraphin tap in, because I gotta go to tech. Um, <laughs> I think 
in general in culture, I, I have a little, I fear this sort of, it's so cliche, but loss of attention span, and the sense of being able to, to stay with a, say, 2,000 word piece, my piece that long. <laughs> um, I really delve into critical thinking, and stay with this, and ask questions, and probe, and, and this, because we're so, getting so used to, read the headline, share it on Facebook, read, like, retweet this, you um, know, so that's kind of fear I have there, but I, I definitely, I so hear everything you're saying about meet people where they are, meet the culture where it is, because that's where we're all going to flourish. Thank you. For, thank you so much for sharing for sharing that. Um, I guess I kind of want to clarify, because I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants, about, <laughs> especially, especially what I was saying about social media. So I love the fact that it is so easy for me to reach an audience that cannot afford to subscribe to the print edition of The Globe just by tapping a few, tapping out a few characters on my phone and sharing an article. And I love the fact that I can just share music with somebody, and share another writer I admire's article. It's, it's great. But the, but the other thing, that, the thing that I think was making me more anxious was the fact that I guess that the barrier between somebody who has a lot more power and more clout if you write up something negative about them and the writer themselves is getting much thinner with the advent of social media. Like I brought up the review in Pitchfork of Lizzo's album where um, Lizzo's fans I think were sending harassing messages to the writer who was also a woman of color. And it's, as I said, it's a complicated situation. There are some really wonderful things about social media and about like the fact that it's so easy for anybody to find these artists that deserve a bigger platform and elevate them. But also it's a space where, where a lot of people can be extremely nasty and face their consequences. Not that those spaces have never have all, haven't always been present, especially for people from marginalized groups. Yes. Yeah, I was I, I had two thoughts about social media when we were talking about it. Um, and, and it's, it deals with what you're also bringing up about social media. That is where the audience is, and that is the growing place, and that is where we need to go. When we're talking about headlines, for example, you know, we've got to get a snappy headline or else people are going to see it. And that speaks to the business model that has to do with social media. Because you're, you're evaluating something by way of clicks as opposed to a newspaper, which when you buy the paper, you've signed up for the whole paper. <laughs> so whether you read the sports or the arts or whatever, you know, you're already signed on, you're already committed, and, and there it is. The, the other piece to social media is that because of it, it has to be something Ed said about expertise. And this is hugely crucial to me and I think to everybody in this room. You know, if you're going to have critics, you want to know that these critics are informed, that they can write, that they can speak, that they can form thoughts, that they can have a reaction that we can, um, that's, that's intelligent to some extent. Um, and because social media is uh, such a, what's the word, it's such a, you know, it's so open to everybody, but everybody's a critic. You know, everybody can be a critic, everybody can have a voice. So the question is how do you make a particular voice is heard, or how does one, um, how do we value critics online as opposed to just people who have a lot of followers? So, I mean, that's that's an issue with social media. I mean, you know, people who have big voices don't necessarily have the best voices, mm -hmm. if I may. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, McDonald's sells billions of burgers, but that doesn't make it gourmet food. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we have to deal with that. There's a certain kind of uh, evaluation that people have to be willing to make. And, and who gets to do that evaluation? I guess. Exactly, and who gets to do it? Um, did our panelists have yeah. a I'll, I'll tag off that, that I do sometimes experience imposter syndrome. Like, people come to this work, a lot of people have seen it. Who am I? <laughs> and it's like, I have to remind myself, I have a master's degree in dancing and therapy. And at the end, like, I've been doing this. I have a sense of, like, the body and what it symbolizes, what it means, what movement means contextualize it in dance history. Uh, but it's an interesting question about where does our authority come from and how we show that. Uh, and again, I, I do come back to it's, this is how I experience the work, but this is what the work was to my trained eye. And this is how I contextualize the work in the world today, the world before, the, the world of this art. And how coherent you can, you can defend a point of view, uh, make a case for your point of view in, in writing. But I'm thinking, argument. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I also 
think that there that there is this um, that there's a sort of um, reactionary stance that, that sometimes we'll take with social media, um, like all oh, those young whippersnap, you know, like <laughs> that social media that's just like you know um, you know uh, like making things worse or like. Um, really diminishing our product or making us compete for clicks, but really like what we're selling is thought. I mean what we're selling is ideas. What we're selling is like incisive, informed commentary about our shared humanity through the lens of art, through the lens of a cultural artifact. And if the writing is good, if the writing is good, if your thoughts if your thoughts are um, cutting and incisive and revelatory, people will click. People will click. Of course, there are, you know, modern journalism conventions, best practices, sure. But that's been changing all along. The platforms have been changing all along. What matters is like the work, the rigor of the work. And if that is there, um, then then the people will come. And, and the other thing I, I will say about social media is, for us, it's been a huge asset. You know, because. For us, we're reaching people who don't listen to WBUR, who don't like get up and like go to WBUR.org slash artery, but that we're speaking to in a specific cultural cadence, an authentic cultural cadence that's resonating with them in a, in, in a, in a platform that feels native to them, that feels natural to them. Um, and so it's, it's been a huge asset for us, not just to build readership, but also to build community. Like a community of writers, a community of of, um, of loyal readers and listeners who, who did not engage with us before, um, and also it allows us to be humble, um, to, to like exercise humility, you know, because you're out in the open on social media, and and people talk a lot about call out culture and the toxicity of call out culture, but. Um, Sometimes people gotta get called out. You know what I mean? Like, like sometimes that has to happen. And like, you know, I'm I'm a believer in calling in, you know, and like, but but I'm also a believer that like, if I'm called out, like I just have to accept it with humility, and um, I have to think about that and and like process the criticism against me, and then try to like figure out like how much of it is rooted in truth, how much is how much of it is rooted in ego, how. And like, and then respond humbly. Like I just, you know, to, what I'm saying is social media doesn't scare me. Yeah, and in line with what you were saying, there's also a dialogue that I don't think really existed at the Globe when it was just mm -hmm. me giving my opinion and the yeah. newspaper. Maybe I'd get a letter, maybe I'd get two. But now if I were to say something like that, I'm mm -hmm. not then I would expect somebody like you to say, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I would say that the comment section, the comment section um, at the Globe is still absolutely a dumpster fire, but yeah. <laughs> it definitely allows me to engage with readers and hear from them in a way that, well, I mean, sometimes I get emails too, but in a way that maybe you didn't have when you were there. Uh, no, the emails were just coming. In the Middle Ages. Uh, in the black shirt. Okay. <laughs> in the right, right there. You, yes. Oh, me? Yes. Oh, in the black shirt. Sorry. Yes. Oh, hi. Um, so my question is, I think it's relevant for audiences when we're talking about cultural critics and, and, and uh, critics of, of art talking about like who their writing is for, but it's also relevant to the pipeline in the sense that writing about cultures, and I think this is particular for film and TV, which is what I'm interested in, um, but if you're trying, if you're like me and you're trying to become a, 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 a critic, you're trying to talk about culture, I no longer get to just watch like whatever is on TV. Like if I want to talk about a show, I have to have stars, but I also have to have Showtime, and I also have to have HBO Go, and I have to have Hulu, and I have to have Netflix, and I can't keep up with <laughs> all of these different platforms. Like, oh, the new hit show is on this platform, and I'm like, okay, sign up for a free trial for a month, and then, <laughs> uh, and so all of these shows are accessible either to people, or films are accessible to people who either have that platform already, but especially as someone who's trying to get into that industry, it's no longer like, oh, I go to movies and there's maybe one movie that everybody's talking about or one film. 
I am actually watching Mad Men for the first time because I have Netflix and everyone was talking about it 10 years ago and I'm like, well, now I have enough money to like have Netflix. So how do we how do we deal with this decentralization of content, which is critical for would-be uh, cultural commentators to actually access and then comment on, but then also if you're out there writing about these different shows and only whoever ha like happens to have access to HBO Go gets to actually read that, what does that what does that do for the audience and what does that do for the public? <laughs> well, but if, if you're connected yeah, yeah. already, you can you might be able to do that. But if you're just some sort of like, oh, I want to write on medium because no one has ever heard of me before, you know, and maybe you can you know borrow someone's password or something. But over time, it's just not sustainable. So I was wondering if maybe Ed, you had any comments about that. I would just say, <clears throat> I mean, uh, to pick up on what Danielle said too, that you know, just try to get some clips together so that you can get publicists to send you stuff. Um, it's, it's not as difficult as it, as it sounds, and um, so I think that you have to establish yourself to a certain extent in order to be able to get onto those lists, but once you do, then you'll get probably more than you want. Um, as a publicist, I will say, show me publicists that will not give you access, no matter how big or small your platform is, and I'll show you that publicist. Because <laughs> all of it's there. Just ask. I guess I have two, two main pieces of advice for that. I think the, the one thing I would say is, just in terms of mechanics and like getting there, is um, just start a website, like get on Medium or a personal blog or whatever. You don't start small. Just start doing it. Just start doing it. But don't think about doing it perfectly. Don't just like you know get excited about it if you want to do TV and film, and like start a blog or start writing on Medium, and then have a few like pieces of criticism under your belt that that you publish on your own from like a, a show that you're excited about watching or a film, um, and then pitch it to an editor, um, not what you've already written, but say, hey, I'm an aspiring film critic, like these are, this is like my writing that I've, that I've started. Um, and then, you know, pitch it, pitch it to, to an editor. Um, you, you might not get accepted on your first pitch, but, but if you keep trying, you, you might. But like the, the second, that's sort of the mechanics, that's sort of like how to get there. But this, the most important thing I think is find like what you love to understand. Find the thing, the, 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 the cultural artifact that like makes you the most curious, that makes you, that makes your head spin, that makes you want to like unpack it, and then like, and then study that canon of, of, of that specific art form, and like, and develop an expertise and a voice, like that, that's, that's I think what's gonna, what, what's gonna set you apart, is like, if, if you've done the rigor, you know what I mean? If you're like, it, it's just your voice. And don't worry about being encyclopedic. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> it's no more possible today with TV than it is with books. I mean, when I first started writing about TV, there were four channels. <laughs> so it was very easy to be encyclopedic, but it isn't now. Nobody really expects even Matthew Gilbert can't be encyclopedic about television. Um, to tag off that, just build a portfolio. Um, Right, and, and now it's a little bit easier with Google Docs. Just basically everything you write just stays in your Google Docs. But um, when I wanted to get into this work and I had you know, James and Foreman, this magazine, this online magazine that I had read, I would love to write for them. From college, because I saved these things, I had it to, to go ahead and say this is what I can do. Um, and also, just to comment a little bit on this idea of who can access the art. And what is, say about the art, it's receiving it, and all these, these questions. The dance world has been grappling with that for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of along with postmodernism, moving to more unconventional spaces, questioning who the audience is, and who the makers are, and how they can access it. Um, you know, the proscenium convention, questioning that. Um, and I was just thinking, you were talking about TV, and how you access these things. The dance world is talking a lot about dancing with the stars, and we you can dance and those things, and it's like, is that really dance art? Well, it's a lot of tricks. Mm -hmm. Is 
that in concert dance. And um, it's interesting, we've, I feel like we've been talking a lot about um, the masses, so to speak, and, and what the art means then, what commentary on it, who has authority. Um, so those questions are definitely not being answered. They're important. Um, so we are at the second. Um, and we're we do actually have to vacate this room because there's a rehearsal an hour and we love to be seen in our space. So I want to thank all our panelists very much for being here. Thank you. Um, physically in the space right now, sorry, Colorado, there is still food and drink in the lobby. So if the panelist is good enough to stick around and have some conversations, you can 